So first, I'll give you some classic views as to whether psychology, and in particular soft psychology, can be seen as a progressive research program. And I'll talk about Lakatos' view in his classic 1970 uh, chapter, and also the view of uh, Paul Mill. And uh, both were very critical about uh, psychology. And then I'll briefly consider the defense, by, defense of psychology by Serling and Lapsley. And I'll argue that basically their defense uh, is uh, uh, failed. Now, most of the discussion here is going to be about soft psychology. And I'll argue that maybe a field called, or subfield called cognitive psychology uh, is in a better position. And uh, the sense is closer to the hard uh, sciences. And when making this argument, I'll talk about uh, the idea of a cognitive architecture, which is going to be a very important role uh, in my talk. Uh, well, I conclude that uh, even cognitive psychology has problems with respect to uh, progressive research programs. And uh, in fact, like most, uh, if not all, psych psychology, the big weakness is that there is no way of tracking, uh, of keep, keeping track of the empirical records, record of uh, theories. And I argue that to address this issue, uh, one need to do two things. First, one need to use the formal theories. And also, one need to have some kind of uh, methodology to uh, uh, track the empirical record of theories. And I'll argue that the uh, methodology that I developed with Peter Main called robust testing methodology is one way uh, forward. So let's start with Lakatos's uh, opinion of research in uh, psychology. Uh, and it's a very negative view, and I do apolo apologize to my colleagues here, <laughs> but Lakatos is going to say the following, not me. So, uh, what clearly Lakatos said that research programs in psychology are not progressive. And speaking about social psychology, he said, this theorizing has no unifying idea, no heuristic power, no continuity. Empirical adjustments do not adapt to a genuine research program and are, on the whole, worthless. Very harsh words, uh, but you want us that. We pick you. He was a rather <laughs> direct person. <laughs> And uh, in his chapter, Lakatos refers to a paper by uh, Paul Mill, which he calls a uh, brilliant paper, and I do agree with Lakatos. And I'm brief, going, going to very briefly summarize this paper. Well, first, I should say that Paul Mill was both a philosopher and a psychologist. And in fact, uh, he was a very well known psychologist. He was, uh, in 1962, president of the uh, APA, which is the American Psychological Association. And in that 1967 paper, he was interested in the impact of hypothesis testing on the development of uh, theories. And basically, he discovered a very surprising and shocking uh, paradox, though many people kind of knew about it in some way, but he really kind of showed that in a very uh, striking, striking way. So imagine that you imagine, imagine that you improve the experimental precision of your experiments. You get better tools in psychology, you get more subjects, these kind of things. So if you do that in physics, this is going to be make harder for uh, theories to make correct predictions. So at the beginning, when you don't have very pressure, uh, precise measure, maybe you are going to say, well, the time is going to be 10 seconds plus or minus five seconds. And then you get better measures, better instruments, and then your prediction is 10 seconds, plus or minus, I don't know, 100 milliseconds. And then basically it's harder and harder for a theory to make a correct uh, prediction. By contrast, in psychology, if you get a better experimental uh, precision, you get the, the opposite, that is, theories are more likely to succeed. And the aim of, the, of that paper is to show that in the long run, assuming a perfect power, basically any theory in psychology as a 0.50 probability of, uh, succeed, of uh, predicting some data correctly. Um, and the, the big difference, of course, here is about the kind of hypothesis that is being tested. In physics, uh, researchers test point uh, hypothesis or point predictions. 
And in psychology, we tend to use a null hypothesis. And the null hypothesis is really the, the origin of this big uh, problem. Now, some people have argued that Lakatos and Mill are too harsh. And in particular, Serlin and Lapsley uh, wrote a paper arguing that, uh, in fact, in psychology, we do have uh, progressive research programs. And they mentioned a paper, paper by Peter Urbach on the IQ research, which they argue is in part uh, a successive research program. And also, they use Lakatos reconstruction of uh, science as a way to address uh, means uh, criticisms. However, a few years later, uh, Da uh, basically uh, refuted that argument by Serling and Lassley. And uh, really, Da's argument has two parts. The first one is that if you look at Lakatos' views, the kind of views I presented at the beginning, it's a bit hard to uh, basically argue that uh, his uh, epistemology is going to support research in psychology. And the other part of uh, Dar's argument is that, in fact, null hypotheses are, uh, in a sense, a disaster for uh, research in, in psychology. And nowadays, of course, psychology has a big replicability crisis. Well, not only psychology, but other sciences as well. But uh, a very uh, constant line of uh, reaction towards this uh, replicability crisis is that basically uh, it's incorrect. Uh, wrong to use an uh, hypothesis. And uh, we should use basically a point of each So these are very, very old ideas which are uh, rehashed. So all the debate so far was about what is sometimes called the uh, soft psychology, which is going to include clinical psychology, social psychology, counseling, part of developmental psychology, and a few other uh, subfields. And uh, one could argue that some other subfields of psychology are closer to the hard sciences. And maybe a good example of this would be cognitive psychology. And cognitive psychology is just a reminder of studies, perception, learning, memory, decision making, uh, and so on. And uh, this is a type of uh, psychology that uh, uses uh, uh, experiments, and is, uh, what could be called pure experiments with a random assignment and these kind of things. And also there is a lot of uh, formal modeling, mathematical modeling, computer modeling, uh, and so on. And within research in cognitive psychology, a concept which is very uh, relevant to the, what I'm talking about today is the idea of a cognitive uh, architecture. And this concept was developed in particular by Alan Newell uh, in his 1990 uh, book. So the idea of a cognitive architecture is that it's an architecture that's going to provide a blueprint to, of the human uh, mind from which different models can be uh, developed. Everything is going to ex be expressed as a computer program or a suite of computer programs, which is going to allow you to make uh, uh, precise and quantitative uh, predictions. Also, a very important idea of uh, the concept of a cognitive architecture is that the architecture should make predictions different domains, or at least in many different experiments, so that you can bring together many different uh, constraints. And if you do that according to Newell, what you can do is to turn uh, free parameters into uh, fixed parameters. There are uh, several cognitive architectures, and probably the most famous are uh, SOAR, which was developed by Newell. The classic reference is his book, is 1990. And another very influential, influential cognitive architecture is ACTAR, which was developed by uh, Anderson and his colleagues. In the classical reference, his, his book also in 1990. By the way, both architectures are still uh, alive, and there is a lot of research on both uh, of them. And uh, one very interesting difference compared to most psychology, which uh, uses a Popperian type of hypothesis testing uh, approach, is that researchers interested in cognitive architectures use a much more theory building uh, approach. They pretty much uh, reject the idea of uh, a kind of hypothesis uh, testing. Now, all this looks very good, and maybe cognitive architectures are going to save uh, psychology. And I think to stop my talk here. But unfortunately, it's not the case. Uh, well, first, Newell in his book mentions Lakatos only very briefly. 
And his point is that theories are not discarded when they make uh, incorrect predictions, but rather they should be revised and they should use the incorrect predictions and the anomalies as a guide from, uh, for uh, improvement, which is obviously very uh, reasonable. However, the brief mention of uh, Lakatos Van Uyl has led several researchers to well, wonder whether, in fact, cognitive architectures are really uh, Lakatosian research programs. And I'm going to mention only uh, the conclusions reached by uh, Rick uh, Cooper, who wrote several uh, papers on the topic. Well, first he concluded that SOAR is not a progressive research program. And here, Cooper's argument is that SOAR focused on uh, engineering issues and not really on empirical data. So all the empirical side of uh, Lakatos' argument is not really covered by uh, SOAR. And I think it's a fairly correct uh, assessment. With respect to ACTAR, Cooper argues that ACTAR fares better. However, and that's going to be the theme of what I'm going to talk about uh, from now, now on, it's very unclear whether the successful predictions made by earlier versions of the theory are going to hold with the later versions. So we have the first version, let's say, which makes a great prediction that's supported by the data. So the theory is correct about this data point. Then you have a few revisions of the theory, and because you revise the theory to explain more data, you cannot explain uh, uh, the first uh, experiment. Okay? That could happen. And ideally, you would like to, to know whether it's the case or not. But Cooper's point is, in fact, you don't know. So the very basic you don't know whether what was successful with the pre previous versions of the theories is still successful with the current version. And this, of course, is a big problem uh, with respect to uh, Lakatosian uh, scientific research program. Because Lakatos made very clear that in a scientific research program, each theory has at least as much content as the unrefuted content of, the, of its predecessor. So if you don't know the content of the current theory or the predecessor, then basically you cannot play Lakatos uh, game. I think in fields like uh, physics, you can't take for granted that uh, people really know whether uh, the current theory can explain the previous uh, uh, results. Maybe I'm a, a bit naive about this, but I would uh, assume that this is much more likely than in uh, uh, psychology. But in, in psychology, for most theory, we simply don't know whether this is the case. So we don't know whether a revision of a theory still explains the, explains the data that the previous theory uh, explained. And one actually quite uh, obvious and uh, disappointing reason for that is that we don't even know what the previous theory really explains. Uh, you might think it's a conclusion which is, or a description which, which is too hard, which is really what is happening in uh, psychology. Now, of course, if you don't have this information, you cannot evaluate whether a research program is theoretically uh, progressive or empirically uh, progressive. And I think this is together with the use of um, uh, non hypothesis testing, this is the reason for the, the slow progress in uh, psychology research. And uh, of course, in this respect, theories that are informal are very, very weak because you, s you cannot make uh, quantitative predictions with these kind of theories. And basically, you just don't know what the theories are uh, predicting. But uh, this difficulty in keeping track of data explained by pre previous versions of uh, uh, theory, this applies to formal uh, approaches as well. But of course, as I mentioned before with uh, ACTA, but I think this applies with most uh, cognitive architectures. And the reason for that is don't, we don't have uh, the correct uh, methodology for doing this. But uh, I beg you not to despair because I think I have a solution to that. At least the beginning of a solution. And I hope I'll convince, convince you of that in the uh, coming uh, minutes. And that's a methodology I developed with Peter Lane, which is called the Robust Testing Methodology, or RTM. <coughs> and this is a methodology which is based on the Agile Development Methodology in Software Engineering which is actually quite uh, uh, simple. The idea is that you, if you develop a piece of uh, software, you write uh, tests, and then you systematically 
apply these tests. Basically, every time you write a new line in your software, you go through all the tests. So that, that's the, the key idea. And basically, we apply that to a scientific software, including cognitive uh, architectures. And we argue that there should be three layers of tests. The first one are the unit tests, which are basically what is done in uh, software uh, engineering. Then the process tests, and then the canonical result uh, tests. And uh, I'll tell you in a few minutes exactly what these uh, are. But first, I would like to um, repeat that these tests are going to be applied every time you make a change to your uh, program. So if you write a new uh, method, if you use uh, object-oriented programming or a new function or whatever, basically you go through all the tests. Okay. And because computers are very quick today, it's not a big deal. It's very quick and you can do that. Also, before I describe the three layers of testing, I would like just to clarify some uh, use of our, um, uh, of our terms, which might not be totally uh, standard. Well, by theory, we mean a high-level explanation of the architecture, and also the know-how about how to basically use the uh, architecture. The architecture is the implementation in computer code of the theory, and finally, a model is a particular application of the architecture to a task. And the model is uh, obviously going to be running a computer program. And uh, here, in this uh, figure, we have the three uh, layers. The theory at the top, which is basically a kind of informal description of what you have in mind. The architecture, which is already a piece of code, and then the specific models. And when you make a, a change to the theory or to the architecture, what might happen is that this is going to affect the way the models are running. In fact, if, you, if the change is quite big, it could be the case that a given model might, might not run uh, anymore. And that's something you want to, uh, to test. On the other hand, if you make a change to a model like this one, this might give you ideas about how you might want to change the architecture or even the theory. So the, the, flow go, the flow of information goes in both ways. Now, a brief description of these various uh, tests. But the unit tests are concerned with the specifics of the implementation. So this is really the, the test used, as I said before, in software engineering. So one idea would be that every time you uh, correct a bug, you write a test to make sure that this bug doesn't uh, uh, reappear. And uh, of course, if the test fails, it means that there's a, an error in the code, and you basically have to correct that, uh, that code. So from a philosophical point of view, the next two tests are much more uh, interesting. The first one are the process tests. And these are basically tests about the implementation of the fundamental uh, processes of mechanisms of the theoretical uh, framework. And basically, you want to make sure that your algorithm is implementing the correct, uh, given mechanism in the correct way. So for example, if you are interested in backpropagation, you want to make sure that your code is really doing backpropagation. An advantage of these process tests, uh, and obviously all these tests are a bit of code, <coughs> is that they provide working examples of uh, the behavior that you want to de describe. So you basically get some kind of documentation for, for free. Now, if such a test is failing, it could be either that there's a problem with the implementation, so it's more than the level of uh, coding, or it could be that the way you thought about the mechanism is just incorrect, more at a kind of uh, theoretical uh, level. And of course, you, you may want to correct that. It might uh, entail changes to the theory itself. And of course, because it changed the implementation, it might affect the behavior of other model, models uh, as well. The third layer is about the canonical uh, results. So these are tests about the empirical evidence that was previously successfully accounted for by the theory. And these tests are going to get to, to include information about, uh, of course, what kind of data were uh, explained by the theory, at least in previous versions. You could also have information about the goodness, uh, goodness of uh, fit and these kind of things. But also importantly, you have um, information about the way the experimental protocol was implemented. 
And in psychology, like in other sciences, the detail of the X model protocol can be quite important. And it could be the case that the way you wrote the protocol is not really what people did in the actual uh, experiment. So all this can be uh, documented. As I said before, every time you make a change to the theory, you go through all the tests. And of course, when you uh, simulate a new experiment, that's a change to the theory, and you go to all the tests, including all the previous canonical uh, results. And uh, this test could uh, fail for a variety of reasons, and I mentioned two reasons here. The first one is that you made a change to the architecture, and then, uh, in fact, a given model is simply not going to run uh, anymore. So, for example, um, uh, your model of learning uh, expects that uh, the information is in normal format, and now your uh, information is, uh, is in a visual format, and the model doesn't work. Uh, of course, that's not very exciting, but still, that could uh, happen. But also, and that's probably more exciting, the model is going to run, but you don't get the good feed that you, get, you got before. And that could be because of an interaction between different mechanisms or different uh, uh, parameters. And of course, you, you want to understand that, uh, and then you need to update uh, the theory, the implementation. Um, and uh, in the best case, you can uh, explain the old canonical results uh, again, and that's great. So you uh, expand the, the coverage of the theory. But in some cases, because you have added new exciting uh, results, you cannot explain the, some previous uh, canonical uh, results. And then there's a question of what you do uh, with this and come back, come back to that uh, a bit later. I'm going to give you uh, very briefly an example of such an architecture in uh, action in the methodology. And that's an architecture called uh, CPAL for chunk based incremental processing and learning. And it's worked in collaboration with uh, Andrew Yesop and uh, Julian Pine of the University of Liverpool. And to be honest, all the work has been done by uh, Andrew Yesop, who's doing all the, the programming. And that's a theory of uh, uh, children's development of first uh, language. And the, th the theory and implementation explain things like. Uh, speech segmentation, vocabulary growth, speed of lexical processing. And it does that in different languages. And with some of the experiments, uh, we can do that in 20 different languages. Uh, and the program or the theory or architecture, to be precise, is implemented in uh, Julia, which is actually a great language if you really use uh, uh, the test. And uh, in the current version, uh, there are 526 automated tests. So every time you make a change to the program, you go through all these tests. And just a very brief example about the kind of tests you have. So the theory is about learning words. So you have to make sure that if you present the same words several times, the program is going to learn them. And that's what the, the different tests are doing. So basically, you first you present the different uh, words uh, several times. You test that the words have been learned. And then you test things like, uh, well, the words are going to be stored in long-term memory. And you test that the, uh, the size of long-term memory is longer after learning than before learning. So it's uh, incremental. I mean, of course, that's pretty obvious, but that's the point of this test. Also, you test that uh, for um, every word, there is a, a single uh, representation, which is a part of the theory. Of course, you could have a different theory, but in this theory, you have a single representation, and you have a test uh, for that. So you test relatively boring stuff, but the point is that uh, by doing that, uh, you make your, uh, sof your software much more uh, robust. And this is what you get if you run all the, the tests. Uh, well, in that case, all the tests are successfully uh, passed. Of course, sometimes uh, some of the tests are going to fail, and you get a warning about that. You also get uh, a feedback, maybe, what is the possible reason uh, for that. And as you can s see with the timing, all this is very, very good. I think this methodology raises some uh, interesting questions with respect to uh, the Lakatos research uh, 
programs, in, uh, also actually to more broader uh, questions in philosophy of science. The first issue or point is that it is sometimes claimed that different experimental traditions in psychology lead uh, to uh, data that cannot be uh, compared by different uh, theories. Uh, however, if you are able to code your data and use them as canonical results, there is no reason why other people who have a theory about the same topic couldn't use the same uh, results. So, I mean, that's in a sense a pretty boring point, but uh, that's in psychology a very common defense that uh, your theory cannot explain my data because my data has this kind of particular thing. But if you, again, uh, express that as a copy of code, that shouldn't be uh, an issue. The next point is more interesting. It's about replication. Uh, a lot of computer modeling is done in the following way. Somebody collects uh, new data and then writes uh, a program that explains this data. That's seen as a very good practice in psychology. I've written many papers like that. Uh, myself. But then, of course, if you collect new data, uh, they are not going to be replicated. And uh, in recent years, I have done a lot of research with uh, meta analysis, and it's obvious that there is a lot of variability in the data in psychology. So it, I would argue that uh, this way of uh, proceeding is not particularly uh, uh, strong. But then, if you have replications, you have uh, other issues. What should you use as a target for your simulations? Should you use the meta-analytic statistics, so a summary of all what you've seen? Should you, should you pick up the best theory, I'm sorry, the best uh, experiment with a type of control and simulate that one? Or should you simulate all the experiments so that you can pay attention to the, for example, difference in uh, uh, methodology between experiments? I don't have really an answer to that, but I think that these are uh, interesting questions. And in fact, that almost can be seen as an um, empirical question, and you could use the kind of methodology I'm talking about to explore these uh, issues. The next part is, uh, goes back to this uh, situation where you add a new um, uh, results that your theory can explain, but by doing that, you cannot explain some previous uh, results. And what do you do with the data you could explain? You just forget about them. That's probably not very rational. So in a sense, you keep them, and you make a note so that you cannot explain them. And when I prepare my talk, I thought, well, this is obvious. So why am I talking about that? But in fact, there is a yeah, much more uh, subtle issue, which is that um, if your theory is able to explain, let's say, 50 uh, experiments pretty well, and then there are these two experiments you cannot explain. Something maybe is wrong with these experiments. Maybe the methodology is pretty bad, or maybe the data could be just uh, faked. So, in fact, you can use to, uh, this kind of methodology and cognitive architectures in general as a way to identify uh, experiments which might uh, raise some uh, sus suspicion of uh, data fabrication. And the last point is about uh, to go directly back to uh, Lakatos and his idea of a uh, hardcore and protective belt. So the idea here is that uh, can we take uh, this idea very, very seriously and basically ask programmers to of officially declare in their code that this part is the hardcore, this part is the protective belt. Now, of course, I realize that Lakatos had a historical view and he said he didn't say uh, I don't think it is a that idea, but still, it's a kind of uh, intriguing uh, idea. And also, if you are interested in the uh, protective belt, in fact, there are different types of uh, assumptions. Maybe you could, you could also highlight the different assumptions that you are uh, making. And there is a nice paper by Paul Mill where he discusses the various types of uh, assumptions that can be made in the protective uh, belt. So, to summarize, I've argued that progress in psychology has been very slow. Uh, and also, I've argued that the current replicability crisis has highlighted the fundamental problems. Of course, these problems have been known for ages by me and Lakatos and others. Uh, if you want to deliver a progressive Lakatosian research program in psychology, what you should do is to implement the theories formally 
for example, using computer programs, and also track the extent to which the data is accounted for by the different versions of the theory. And I've argued that uh, RTM robust testing methodology has a practical, offers a practical way to, to do this. And also it offers additional advantages like uh, documentation almost for free, uh, debugging, and also a deeper understanding of the architecture. Of course, writing all these tests takes a lot of time, uh, but you basically get all these advantages. And uh, the last one, the deeper understanding of the art architecture is obviously a very important one. And even though I've focused here about um, uh, cognitive architecture, arch architectures, I think the methodology is very general uh, and can be used for uh, modeling different types of uh, science. Thank you very much. <laughs>